if uh, you drove all the way up. So I'm yeah, yeah. trying to get you. Oh, all right. Oh, the ship's best in the night. All right. So um, talk about LIDAR. Um, I'm assuming there's some level of knowledge, so we're just not going to go that deep. I know a couple of people have deep level of knowledge. It's a laser emitter that it generates laser pulses. Oh, but there's a little bit more than that. Uh, so that's that's what we want to talk about. But uh, I do have also ulterior motives here. I hate to eat lunch alone, as uh, Eric would tell you. Eric or Alex? Oh, Alex. Alex. Yeah. Yes. Alex would tell you. And so um, I'm trying to start a, a lunch series. Uh, just to come around, and there's just so much information coming on autonomy these days that now I get some emails from people that like, hey, you should read this article. But then let's do more than that. Let's talk about it. And then let's try to connect lunch rooms from different hive participants. If there are people out stuck out in the grand sky, you can't come down, at least we can connect the Northrop lunch room or some other means, perhaps other sites, and try to have that. But this is supposed to be interactive. Joe's promised that he's going to tackle as much as he can, and so uh, we'll uh, we'll try to do that. The other thing is I'm um, trying to pull together more in-depth information about uh, sensors and systems that are going to be used for autonomy. And um, I find right now there's really no textbook available for that. So I'm actually pulling together that unless people know about textbooks on aut autonomy sensors. So I would be very interested to know. But I think there's, as autonomy becomes more and more important, that's, there's a need for that, all of that information at, at a design engineering level to be compiled in, in a textbook style. So working on that, and that, since I have not too many other projects going, and um, so that's uh, something to, that's one of my 2024 uh, goals. And so I'm gonna try to present it as, as we go along. Today is not gonna be very technical. We're not gonna go that deep just because it's really not sure. And I'm hoping that that conversation happens afterwards. So uh, let's see. Yeah, I think on the first slide, you may have to advance. And then after that, I can advance. Um, you hit down page. Yeah, one more time and then a third time. So well, how to get into this conversation? Uh, I sent in uh, to Meg. That's good. That's, I, I, I think I can take it from here, Meg. Okay. Um, I don't know why the first slide behaves that way. But the rest of them I can bring in things. Um, I sent in that title and it got changed to big big L, little I, big D, big A, big R. And I said, that's my cue. We haven't even agreeing on how to spell the thing, let alone what it really means. Um, and why do we do that? Why would we spell it in a funny way? And so um that would be the intro to this. And then uh, maybe one more time, Maggie, and then I, I can take it, I think. Unless I. There we go. So um, Bill already told us what the there is, right? I mean, sorry, Joe. Um, that uh, it's just the light radar, yeah? Except, no. It, it, there really is a reason to distinguish LIDAR from radar. <clears throat> and so everybody here knows that radar is radio detection and ranging. LIDAR is somewhat ambiguous. It's not really light detection and range. Even if you could pulse a flashlight fast enough, you couldn't use it for the kind of ranging that, that we, we can do when we use a laser. So when I was, in graduate school decades ago, it was called laser radar. I grew up and left graduate school, became LADAR, except everybody hated to say 
later. It, it just doesn't roll off. So about five years ago, it switched to LIDAR. So if you go back and look at DOD literature seven or eight years ago, they insisted it's going to be LIDAR. It wouldn't change. While the commercial side finally gave up on saying LIDAR and went into LIDAR. <clears throat> and then this funny spelling of LIDAR. That is LIDAR magazine started that. And now it's been adopted, except I have typed with two fingers. So if I if I have to hold the shift down, type capital D and capital A, and cuts my typing speed by 50%. And I am typing with only one finger. So I'm not adopting that. <clears throat> uh, but also I want to convince you that light detection and ranging by itself would not be interesting. It has to be a laser involved. And that's what I'm going to go in through. The type of light, uh, the, the, the quality of the beam uh, is critical. So uh, so how should we spell it? Uh, I'm partial to this because I can spell this one fastest. But I also get into what this really means and what, what the significance of I should be in this text from my personal perspective. I like the modern version. What? Big L, little I, D, A, R. I like the modern yeah, version. Because uh, you, you can type, right? I don't know which text, but it, it picks it up. But you know, uh, anyhow. That you, right, I think, I think the language is changing on me. Uh, again, I'm not sure, I'm not sure we're going to agree on that. Times, and it will change again. Um, so it's, but radar, that hasn't changed. But if you go with that to emphasize, so let's have that debate now. Uh, if you to want to emphasize this as little i, then why don't we spell radar this way? Not necessary. Well, it's not necessary to spell lighter though. It is because of the branding is why it was the opinion, it was the opinion but that I gave you this. Branding. Whoever, whoever, whoever. So, I mean, I don't know. So, if you if you if you kind of go by that logic, radar should have the second a should be a small a <laughs> because it's and it's not a. You mean lidar should also be that? Yeah. So it, so should lidar. It, it just goes crazy, and the branding, like I said, was a magazine branding, uh, <laughs> which is I agree. Yeah. Uh, so no, I'm not going to slow down. Capitalize it all. Yeah. Huh? Just capitalize it all. Capitalize it all so you can hit cap, lock cap, and go. type it, or you can. But why do that? I think we all understand what there's no other word like this that is easy to say. So, but I'm going to come up with a reason why you shouldn't do this. And hopefully, we'll get to that and you'll see hear my point of view and why that is. But, you know, it's uh, just a fun thing to get in. Also, radar. Radio frequency ends right here. Uh, by the time you get to L band, it's now you're into the microwave range. But you still call that radar. Get to millimeter wave, still radar here. Automotive is right here, 77 gig. That we call that automotive radar. That's for autonomy, right? Um, so the Lighter. That's the conversation that we were having the other day. Is what do you mean by light? Light is this portion of the spectrum. Here's the Webster Dictionary definition of light. Um, such radiation that is visible to the human eye. Right? Nobody's going to make a LIDAR system that's visible to human eye, with one exception. If you want to see through water, you have to do it at blue green. Other than that, to be eye safe, to get real power out, you're going to do it in infrared. So you already are violating the light meaning, right? We're, we're screwing up the language in that sense. I am willing to overlook that. There was a very famous book that came out about three, four years ago. Of all the light we cannot see, actually, it's an excellent book if you haven't read it. 
and recommended. And it's talking about radio wave as lights that we can't see. And there's a Netflix movie that's out. And anybody who's got Netflix wants to invite me over to watch it. I haven't seen it, and I'll bring the popcorn. Um, but um, this is a play on language, right? But this is intentional play on language. Uh, so maybe I should go stand on the other side so I'm not blocking oh, you guys. Oh, no, I, I mean, I'm sure to play. I can block still. Oh, both of us showered this morning, so <laughs> we're, we're not offensive. Um, and so... Um, Enough whining. Um, you need to uh, obviously be familiar with radar to understand a lot of what's special about LIDAR. It is all the stuff that we talk about radar is applicable to LIDAR, but probably this one exception of synthetic aperture. I have never seen a synthetic aperture LIDAR. But then again, that becomes a matter of definition of what synthetic aperture. But <clears throat> uh, the definition of the energy source and the antennas and the antenna directivity, beam divergence, intensity, radiation patterns, side lobes, atmospheric obscurance, azimuth and altitude scans, monostatic, biostatic, uh, CW versus pulse uh, radar, Doppler and coherent radar, range ambiguity and pulse repetition interval, line of sight, Ionospheric balance. Well, this one's not relevant either. Uh, polar metric uh, radar and then phased array radar. All of those things have LIDAR equivalent. And in many cases, LIDAR does things above and beyond what radar does. And so uh, we'll talk about that. So, um, <clears throat> the, uh, what Go through a little bit of chronology called the review of what has happened and why we even talk, why there's interest in LIDAR. So the very first widely reviewed LIDAR analysis was by this, and I think this is what you were referring to, correct, uh, Bilbo? Uh, yeah. Came out in 2004. This is put out by NIST. I think back then they already had changed their name from National Bureau of Standards to NIST. But um, yeah, it says so right there. So um, this is a 200 page book, essentially. And they go in through detailed calculations of the uh, return, detection, uh, then uh, signal recovery and all of that. Uh, if you're gonna design a LiDAR system back then, this was the Bible. Of course, nowadays, it's mostly replaced by more advanced calculations. But back then, that was what everybody used to look at. Now, I was deep in magnetics back then, so it, it came to me somewhat later uh, in terms of reading through it. But it's, it's a very nice, very comprehensive analysis of, of uh, mathematical and physical properties of it. At, the, at that point, it was still a LADAR system. Um, the other breakthrough, actually this happened before, but it was published a year after. This was published in 2005, but this was a uh, DARPA project for, I think, since mid-90s to use lasers, and they, they call it laser radar, pretty sure, laser radar, which was the name before LADAR. Um, that uh, demonstrated some of the very critical properties of LIDAR that's even popular today. And people who do um, like surveys and things, they like to see through vegetation. This was the very first example of that. And um, again, like I said, it was a DARPA project. And um, this, is, this is the instrument It was, about 450 pounds uh, mounted on a helicopter. So you're probably not going to put that on your UAS. Uh, but uh, and it, as you can see, it's a monostatic system. Both the receive and um, transmit are on the same optical axis. Did have a focal plane array detector system. And I'll get to that in a little bit. 
as to what all that means. But <clears throat> the very first pictures of this type was published here. People in, in the business knew about it, what was going on. It was a lot of hush-hush work, it was defense work, but um, it was um, the first publication came out in an obscure Lincoln Laboratory journal, but we knew about it. My PhD advisor, uh, who I kept in contact after I left school, actually worked on the early version of this back when he was at Lincoln Labs. Um, so um, this has been in the works for, for a long time. Um, but this was really the very first time. And of course, a lot of this was software manipulation because those of you who know LiDAR signals, you know you get multiple reflections from a beam, a, a pulse that you send in, you get many, many reflections. And so you need to pick the right reflection to see through the vegetation and pick up the tank that's camouflaged underneath. <clears throat> Um, this is a modern incarnation of that. Uh, so this that was de developed by Harris. And Harris merged with L3. So now you can get this still as big as you might think is 25, the same size actually as was before. 25 inch uh, diameter ball, uh, gimbal. But the whole thing is like 30 some odd inches. 210 pounds, I think is. So again, not a UAS compatible system, but this is what's being used. Geiger mode, again, that's a branding name, has nothing to do with uh, uh, alpha particle detection. It's it's actually a, a avalanche photodiode that does what they claim single photon detection, but it's not so. But, and it's very noisy and it's, uh, but it's again, this is the ultimate system and it's tactical. What does that mean, tactical? To me, tactical means that you can use the information and take action on it. Of course, this has to be post processed. It takes, has weeks of latency till you get your data back. So, tactical. So then I realized why they use the word tactical. Because men buy anything that has tactical in its title. So um, tactical candles, I, I buy that. Uh, so um, that is, that's why that's tactical. All right, let's talk about image formation. Um, there, um, so we all know how to take a digital camera, take pictures. Um, you essentially have a focal plane array. It's a CCD chip in your camera. You focus the image on it, and you get six megabytes of information that comes out of it. Nice thing about that is every pixel is measured at once. So there's a lot of uh, parallelism. Frame rate goes up. But does come back. The other way to do it is with the full raster. I was going to put a picture from a scanning electron microscope on there because everybody's seen those bugs in, a, in an SEM picture. Now, an SEM has an electron beam that rasters back and forth, just like the old CRT uh, tubes, um, and creates an image that way. So you can create an image by moving the illumination source or you can create an image by essentially having many, many, many detectors uh, and then just do a flash um, illumination. And that's why this is called flash LiDAR. I don't think people see flash LiDAR these days anymore. I, I don't know if anybody's worked with flash LiDAR. And, and I will talk about a case where the flash LiDAR would be useful, but it's very rare these days. Almost everything is a combination. So you have the zero dimension scan, zero dimension uh, <clears throat> uh, imaging. So you have, let's say, range finders, right? Uh, which the golfers use to figure out how many feet to the to the green. The cops use do whatever they do. Infantry does measure range to your next tank, uh, and so on and so forth. And also, anemometry is generally done this way. 
Then you could have one of each. You could scan in one dimension and image in the other direction. It's probably the most common. All of your, your Velodyne lasers are based on that. They got the rotating thing, and, and then the other dimension is multiple laser that are mounted that way. Aerial survey is pretty much the same thing. You've got um, a scan side to side, and the aircraft is moving that provides the scan direction. Um, and then you have complex architecture. And so that jigsaw is a very complex architecture. It has both flash and a focal plane array. But on top of that, because that didn't give you enough field of regard, uh, you actually scanned that whole thing. Because it was monostatic, both beam and the detector was scanned at the same time. You created a large field of field of regard from a relatively small instantaneous field of view, and um, so we'll talk about different examples of that. But pretty much the industry is now coming down to scanning for three D uh, lidar, and and the reason for that is the promise of improved frame rate comes at such a high cost, and in fact, not worth it. And the reason for that is in a CCD, when you capture an image, you don't get all the pixels, all the six megabytes of pixels out at the same time. CCD stands for charge coupled device. So one pixel goes out into the register and the next one transfers this charge to that. And so let's say you have a 3000 by 2000 pixel CCD array, they all go through the end to the register and then the next line comes through and the next line comes through. So even though the image is captured with a very short um, shutter or very high shutter speed, short shutter interval, the actual downloading of the information takes is done serially. And so you lose a lot of that. Now, you can't do that with LiDAR because LiDAR has to maintain timing information. When did you receive the signal back? How many nanoseconds or microseconds, like generally microseconds after the pulse went out? So if you try to then do it serially back through the channel, well, how do you preserve that information? Because you've transferred your charge from one to next to next. So in a, in a LiDAR flash device, every pixel has to be independently uh, wired to a, an amplifier outside. So it becomes very complex and very expensive. <clears throat> so it's not done anymore, but, but if you have the money, we could do it. But this is what really changed the game. I'm sure you all remember where you first saw this car, the Google car. This is before it became Waymo. And they told you that you could drink as much as you want, still drive safely home. Um, and uh, I mean, that that just really resonated with people, right? <clears throat> so um, even deception starts here. Um, that's not, if you just showed the LiDAR image without the background photo image, it, would, it wouldn't have any meaning to you. Now, a computer can try to make something out of that, but for public consumption, they still have to do a fusion, image fusion between a camera and, and a LiDAR system to, for you to sort of see what's going on. Um, this, uh, this device was first built by Velodyne, which used to build I definition speaker is up to that point. And so the guy just built it in his garage, put 32 lasers all two and a half degrees apart, um, and then put it on a rotating platform. And this became the symbol of LiDAR. And everyone went crazy because now with that, Google promises that we would all be, and this came out in October of 2011, so we would all be having 
Self-driving cars by 2019, I think that was the promise. So it didn't happen. Um, and um, but this changed things in a, in a serious way. So even those of us who kind of have been in the field for decades were very impressed that this could happen. This was the first application of real time LIDAR. Everything else had been post-processed after uh, image was taken. And this was real time processing, edge processing these days, I guess what we call it, where you analyze the data in real time. So, uh, again, if you've been around a while, like Bill and Joe and myself, you've seen this, uh, with the, it has it even has its own name, Gartner Hype Cycle, right? <clears throat> Ooh, a new technology. Now, uh, to the, to you know, to the people uh, in the in the field, Jigsaw was a huge deal, but it really was the Google car that really brought it into uh, into the public focus. And about four hundred fifty million dollars in investment over less than two years went into that. Every automotive company panicked. We have to have a self-driving car. We have to have it before Google in 2019. Um, so um, expectations were very high. It was very highly hyped. Money flew in. There were companies going public that were, I would say, bordering on criminal, making making claims that like they wanted to have a $50 um, at the time. I guess it was already switched to LiDAR then. $50 LiDAR system that you could put on five places on your car and be good to go, all solid state, LiDAR on a chip, let's go. Well, that wasn't going to be physically possible. Um, so, uh, and then self-driving cars haven't quite gotten contracts. Here's where I would invite debate. I mean, I invite debate all the time, but uh, what's going on with self-driving cars? We ever going to have self-driving cars? Uh, I I don't know. I really don't know. Um, probably. Um, the difference between a car and a UAS, though, is cars are on the surface of the earth, so you could get away with only thirty-two lines of resolution on the azimuth. It's the uh, I'm sorry, on the altitude. It's the azimuth that you wanted to get full situational awareness on, on that 360. Um, so um, simple mechanical Velodyne design, and then they made the puck that those of you who've flown LiDAR probably use Velodyne puck, uh, which is a smaller version of that. You put it sideways, and it has either eight or 16 lasers, so it gets eight or 16 line scan at any given time. Um, and then you use the aircraft motion for the other direction. And um, so um, in terms of the hype in LiDAR construction, I think maybe we're bouncing off the bottom now a little bit. It's coming into aerial surveys and such. Meg, how are we doing on time? Oh, we got time. OK, and so. Um, um, the situation is going to be different for UAS, particularly detect and avoid. We need uh, not only azimuth, but we need altitude, fairly high resolution. Generally, you're worried about running into, let's say, a power line. You really can't get away with 32 lines of scan uh, to avoid a two inch power line. So, um, that my prediction is that's going to be the next big hype when somebody demonstrates that you can actually have real time LIDAR that's fully high resolution in both azimuth and azimuth and altitude direction and can respond with you know 10 to 30 frame rate updates uh, as you go forward. That doesn't exist today. But it will happen, and um, 
and that would be then the, the next leg up in this. So uh, we're kind of towards the bottom of excitement on on lidar production. Maybe that should be uh, on the on the Gantner uh, Gartner life cycle uh, usage will uh, eventually grow in static or like low frame rate and you're just flying over static targets. But to do autonomy, you have multiple moving objects in the air at any given time. You need very, very fast reaction, high resolution at the same time. Um, that doesn't exist. So, um, but there is a renaissance that's coming. I am convinced of that. I just have to be patient and exercise hard and eat right. So I live to see it. Um, but um, I took a stab at, so what are the uh, dimensions that you would want to have? Um, or what are the metrics that you'd like to have for that to be successful? And uh, dimensions are, about three and a half inches, weight about two pounds, power draw of about 40 watts, and then cost of less than 20,000. Full 3D real time uh, performance. Yeah, this, uh, again, if you think back to the early days of Google car, every time the car hit the bump, the LiDAR would go out of alignment. The guy had to get out retune it. Of course, we're past that now, but we got to solve all of that again. Gust of wind, uh, what happens? So um, uh, shock and vibration stability, very, very important. Um, max range, this is probably the hardest to get to 300 meters, the range resolution of about five centimeters. You got to pick up that line, the power line, at 300 meters, that gives you about half, I'm sorry, three seconds to react to maneuver away from that power line. <clears throat> uh, range resolution of, this is actually a little easier to get, so two centimeter, uh, be able to distinguish two objects that are two centimeters separated in range. Image accuracy, that's generally given by SNR, and I be, we get in kind of nerdy and into the weeds, but 10 dB of SNR gives you 90 some odd percent certainty that you're actually measuring that voxel correct. Um, and the rate of something in the many, a well, handful of uh, megapixels per second, that will get you for a wide field of view that you need total situational awareness, something that you can update at about 10 to 20 frames per second. So latency, that's, again, there's hyperframing is a technical term, but latency of 20 microseconds, and it's probably hard to describe for the, at this time. And then you need image stabilization, which that is these days not a problem. Um, image fusion probably should be on that list as well, because you still need some assistance from other imaging technologies. But this way you could do, um, day, night, all weather operation um, and still be successful. I'm not getting anything from the, the peanut gallery there, so you're supposed to hackle me. I have a hackle. Okay. <laughs> weather. Yeah. Like you just said for all weather. So how does weather impact? Uh, well, the weather impacts this guy. So if you want to see through rain, now you're talking about midway by our, which is no, no big deal except the laser source is very expensive. Because I'm thinking, you know, if you think about up here, we got freezing rain, ice, literally that's coming down, snow, and how does all that impact? And I don't know if wind impacts anything or not, too. Well, I'm assuming that you have ways to deal with icing, uh, heated whatever uh, window, the aperture has to be clear, obviously. Yeah, so weather is an issue. So if I'm driving my car, my Google car. Oh, a Google car, Google car, no. I, this morning, as you were driving in, in the dark, you 
who could tell if it's icy or not? If you can't tell, the Google card can. Um, no, that's that's Phoenix pretty much. It's limited to uh, for Google or Waymo. But you know, who, who's to know? Maybe you throw enough money at it, they will they will go uh, mid infrared. Um, so, okay, we're doing design on the fly here. So polarimetric lidar can take make a difference. So if you hit a surface with um, light polarized parallel to it's it's it would be actually a p polarized light parallel to the um, surface of the ice, and then you compare that to light polarized s polarized perpendicular to the surface of the ice. You see a difference between ice, water, road. So it there is possibly a solution, um, but I think I think up here would be very difficult. Very difficult. It's a lot easier to deal with atmospheric weather than it is road surfaces. The other thing is um, on the road, you just have to make so many decisions all the time. Well, if you're up in the air, your number of decisions you have to make is. Decisions are catastrophic if you make a wrong one, but the number of decisions is not as much. So you can do a lot of edge processing for aerial systems. So you can deal with the weather that way. Uh, Professor, you said that uh, at the beginning you were going to tell us why the spelling of light yeah. is so important. I think that's next. Okay, I didn't want to jump ahead. No, I no, I'm glad we're you, getting close to. Well, that's okay. All right. Now my my machine's not responding. Help! Yeah. Evidently, it's not using lidar. So, uh, well, or misspelling it. I think that's what's going. On. Not registering. That's right. I promise you, I answer that question. Oh. It's intriguing. So I was just. Okay. So here it is, sir. What makes LIDAR special compared to radar is the coherence of the transmit beam. Every photon in that beam that's going on has the exact same wavelength, the exact same polarization, and it's exactly in phase. That's not true with, with radar. Radar, you, you start with good intention, but then it goes through the parametric amplifier, and starts to wobble. So if you look at the um, spectral width of, of a radar system, now for Doppler radar, it probably is a lot better and a lot cleaner, but your average just uh, pulse later, uh, radar spectral width, maybe two or three percent of the center here is like parts, less than parts per million variation in the spectral width. In fact, parts per billion variation in a spectral width. That has a lot of implication. First of all, you get theoretical limit in divergence, so you can keep the beam. So that's why light, if, even if you use a flashlight, it diverges too much. You just can't reach any useful distance. It maintains very low divergence. Power density goes up. If every photon's in phase, it coherently adds up. Your power density goes up the square of what if they were incoherent, these photons were interfering. And the power sources are very, very compact and very, very efficient. The, the wall plug efficiency of a semiconductor laser, high power laser, is still in the like 40, 50% of the electric powers converted. So if you just try to use a flashlight on, so I said 40 watts is what you need. If you did not have a coherent beam, you would need 400 watts. It's just the efficiency is not there. Um, 
The short wavelength obviously is very helpful. It can give you good, very high spatial resolution and also wide bandwidth, so you can modulate the beam very, very quickly. Um, so we should maintain laser in the primary application. Without having a laser as a source, LIDAR doesn't work. So, but I also like to say LIDAR. So I'm saying laser imaging detection and ranging is probably the more Uh, so let's talk about some of the outside applications other than uh, sen sense and avoid. Um, if you have a Doppler LiDAR, you can use it for anemometry. Um, we pitched this about three years ago, two years ago to the Army. For So Army is coming up with a new helicopter called FARO, Future Advanced uh, Reconnaissance and attack aircraft, or something. Um, and about twenty percent, but uh, they go into a smaller gun, so it's, uh, a twenty cal, twenty millimeter bullets, and um, uh, try to go three miles. And so now windage becomes a serious issue, and they want to carry as as few rounds as possible. So they don't want to you don't want to carry. Um, you don't want to carry tracers. You want to make sure the very first bullet hits the target. So um, uh, if you could measure the wind, then you can get, you can compensate for it. Uh, wind measurement uh, is one of the capabilities of a very stable source. Um, this morning, you guys were talking about. By the way, is this an Apache? Yes. OK. So the Apache has all kinds of gear. This is a 30 millimeter gun. So this was the design we sent to the Army for the, the this is General Dynamics uh, 20 millimeter gun that's going to go on the far. Up. And then we said, well, it's going to cost 100,000. They said, well, thank you. Um, come back another time. So uh, this is probably not the technology of the future for far. Up, but um, you put these um, in the hub. Of, of a windmill. In fact, here's a German version of that. It's a few hundred pounds uh, more, probably. six or seven hundred pounds looking out through the hub. Uh, but then the competition is put a little box like this underneath with the spinning mirror, and that does a fine job. Do you see those in the field? Um, <clears throat> not really. Uh, it's at the moment, it's it's cheaper to put an anemometer on top of the, just a bucket anemometer on top of the. Yeah, so the, the advantage of a, a light anemometer, or laser anemometer, is that it's remote sensing. So yep. it gives you, a burst comes through, it gives you time, release the clutch, adjust the pitch, do all the kind of things that you need. And that's also true of aircraft. I saw um, there's a company called iBot um, that just launched building our size aircraft. So I have to pay attention to what they're doing. And uh, they they have the, the way they're, um, uh, they have a propeller system that adjusts the pitch according to the headwind. So you get more efficiency that way. Clever, but you need to know what wind's coming at you. So yeah, you 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 would want to know a few seconds in advance before the burst hit to be able to adjust for to that. Um, so, but yeah, and so then, you know we pitched part of the energy for that, and again they said thank you very much. Go so we'll put your head down. Um, but really, this is what you need to do, right? You don't need many many of these that also about a hundred thousand dollars each. You just need to put one on a UAS that just flies around the wind farm all day long, measures the wind, maps it out. And also it shows drafting from one to the next to the next to the next, I think, as we were talking about this morning. So that's future. These are all future stuff. We'll get that into uh, some kind of helicopter uh, gun. Uh, another one is polarimetric LIDAR. We just alluded to that about ice detection. 
It's actually really efficient for metal detection. Um, so this is sort of the old paradigm of, are you looking at a, at a gun or a broom? Or again, uh, right now, at least what they tell you is that US military has to have human in the loop to release munition. But if you at some point you got a small aircraft flying through and you see somebody with a gun that you can for sure know it's a gun, at some point that aircraft is going to detonate on its own. Um, but again, those are generally an urban environment, very small aircraft. And um, so you need the next level of reduction in, in swap C. And that's where I think the flashlight uh, LIDAR will come. And it will be Doppler. Maybe building a Doppler LIDAR is not that difficult. Essentially, you take two images simultaneously with polarization one way, polarization the other way, take the difference. Um, but it's very, very sensitive to uh, metal, but again, uh, you need very high resolution, very high frame rates. Uh, so I don't know if at what point you get this thing down, but the swap can be brought down quite a bit to like you know a few ounces. And then uh, atmospheric study. So um, big one is um, for again. Uh, ice, uh, cloud char characterization is dial, differential absorption uh, LIDAR. Um, so again, because the wavelength is very, very, very narrow, I'm sorry, the spectral width is very, very, very narrow, and you can make it with an external cavity, make it very, very stable, you can sit on and off of these water absorption lines in the atmosphere and with fairly high precision tell um, um, the composition of, of the cloud. And if they can simultaneously measure temperature, let's say using a floor system, then you can tell if the cloud is super cooled. So as you go into it, it won't freeze on your on your aircraft. So right now, your typical one requires a trailer and it's a few thousand pounds. So it's at some point that needs to be made small. We pitch that to the Department of um, Energy. Uh, we have actually designed one that fits on a, um, this is a um, scan eagle, so you'd have to cut off the nose. Usually these are going to be side looking because you need the, the uh, front of the nose cone for other navigational tools, but uh, you could do that. We can, we can reduce it again. We're talking about fairly expensive development costs, fairly expensive ultimate product costs. So when you say B uh, percent of this, who do you mean to say B? Semaphore, my old company. That is your company. Yes. We, we had about 20 people at one point before COVID. Um, and I think that's the last one. I know that's the last one. So um, let it rip, Joe. Well, it makes you made really good sense on that slide about why you want to maybe Keep laser in the name, yeah. Imaging in the name. And imaging. Yeah, 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 yeah. Laser imaging. I have a convert. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I think I think just uh, you know we do like like the magazine. You get hung up with the cosmetics of of oh, but of, that, of branding. that light that, that a little eye on top has got light coming out of it. It's beautiful. Why is pi r squared? You yeah. know, it's there's beautiful. symbols that yes, mean right. something, and so. But on the other hand, uh, in this case, it doesn't mean anything. So it's like I agree with and you. Even the light part of it. Again, I think. Uh, Ryan will back me up on this. Okay, we'll we'll give light. Does it, yes, you're not going to build a lidar system unless you're looking through water, in as a light. So it's all going to be infrared. So a laser works better than light. Yeah, question. Uh, I'm just kind of curious, actually. Uh, so I, 
I think I read somewhere that Tesla does not use LiDAR for their self That's correct. They use what? They never photos and they do stitching. Uh, their cars will take photos and then they have parallels. Yeah. They have multiple cameras that yeah. look <clears throat> from uh, to the. It's like use human vision. Yeah, yeah. For depth it, perception. Is that better than LiDAR right now, or are they just not wanting that uh, well, like uh, the look? No, it's not better than uh, LiDAR. And no, you could put like, multiple LiDARs. It's, I think the, the like, if you look at the Chevy Cruze, that LiDAR, you, it's not sitting on top anymore. It's okay. actually in the headlight. Gotcha. Um, no, it was Elon Musk will do what 